Hi, this is Julia from Grad Schools Pro, and today we're going to talk about how to make scientific writing a breeze. So this is Scientific Manuscript Writing 101. So we're going to talk about a few different things. First of all, why scientific writing is important. Then we're going to talk about the assumptions that hold you back. And then we're going to talk about the top three secrets that I use to attract readers to your paper, how to get more citations for your paper, and how to make your paper more interesting. And so let's dive right in. So first of all, why is scientific writing important? What is scientific writing? So scientific writing really is that you communicate your science to other people with your writing. And so in my case, I'm a very interdisciplinary scientist. I had training in various different backgrounds. And so what I found is that a lot of scientists communicate their science in a very expert way and dry manner, which means that scientists in related areas have trouble actually understanding them. So I see scientific communication as you communicating your science to other scientists in your writing. And this could be journal publications, that could be fellowship or grant proposals, that could really be anything that you're writing about. And why is this important? This is important because scientific publications are currently the main metric for productivity in academia. And so let's say if you are an undergrad, you actually have a higher chance of getting into graduate school if you have a publication on your record. If you are a graduate student, you need publications to graduate. And the more or higher quality publications you have, the higher your chances are for later on to get a better or more well-paid job. And so really scientific publications and scientific writing are an incredibly important skill that you need to hone in graduate school. Now, the problem with this is the following. In science and academia at universities and colleges, oftentimes the scientific skills are focused on and scientific communication is basically put on the back burner. So that means scientific communication classes are either not available, they're not for credit, they're not prioritized, or they're not taught well. And so this means that oftentimes it is left to the professor or to the lab to teach you as a graduate student how to communicate your science well. Now, the other problem is that if you look at your professor, they're probably incredibly busy and have a thousand things to do. You're not the only lab member most of the time. And so they don't have the time to teach you exactly how to write well and how to publish well and how to find the right journals for your paper. And so oftentimes what happens is they try to teach you something, but you have to basically reverse engineer their process to be able to figure out how to do that. And lastly, reverse engineering that process even still means that you learn by doing over time they're most often not going to teach you their 10 or 20 year expertise in how to do this simply because that's not their main priority. And so really what happens is oftentimes you as a student are left to your own devices and are expected to figure it out on your own or are expected to reverse engineer the process. This also means that oftentimes this takes a very long time for you to figure it out rather than actually having somebody who teaches you this process directly. So again, scientific communication is the, one of the most crucial skills in your academic career. So imagine you're a graduate student and it takes you, let's say, a year and a half to figure out that process and to write your first paper. Okay, that's nice. If your PhD is a five-year PhD, let's say in the United States, you have a year and a half to write your first paper. Your second paper might go a little bit faster. And then your third paper, again, you're trying to collaborate with somebody and it doesn't quite work out as well. So maybe by the end of your PhD, you have three publications on your record. And that is good. I'm not saying that this is not enough, but compare that to somebody who is being taught those skills like very early on. So let's say it takes you a year to write your first, first author paper. Now your second paper is going to go faster. You're learning something throughout this process. And if you know the tips and tricks of how to publish faster and better quality papers in higher impact journals, maybe by the end of your PhD, you will have five first author publications on your record. And that ultimately makes you a lot more competitive for job offers later on, whether they are going to be academic or in industry or in any other type of organization. So let's talk about the assumptions that really hold you back in writing and in going through this entire process of writing your paper. So the first assumption is that many people have is, I'm just not a good writer. And let me tell you, writing is a learnable skill and it can actually be fun. It's also one of those things that's like, you feel like you're not a good writer, which means you're avoiding it, which means it's actually not going to be fun for you. 
Let me turn this around. Let me tell you that writing is a skill just like science. It's not any more squishy than anything else. There's strategies that you can learn to be able to write your paper. And that means you can follow a step-by-step -step process. That means there's not a lot of question marks throughout this entire process, which can actually make it fun because it's more predictable. So the second assumption that you might have is that, oh, writing can be quick, right? So let's say you were in high school or in undergrad and you wrote a class paper, you had to write class papers and research papers, and you could do this in a weekend. You could do this, heck, maybe in an evening. It wasn't fun, but you could do it and they graded you on it. Okay, so maybe you weren't great at it, but you could do it, right? From a time perspective, this assumption does not hold in graduate school or for anything that you are submitting for publication in a journal. Writing a paper for publication in academia and grad school as a postdoc takes a lot longer than what you're used to. And so you have to plan for that. Then the next assumption is that you do the experiments first and then you write them up. And that's when the writing process starts, right? Let me turn this around here. You can actually use your writing as a planning tool for your experiments so that the whole process will actually go a lot faster. The last assumption that you might have is that the success rate of your experiments, right? So you are used to your experiments working out in the vast majority of cases. Let's say when you were in high school or when you were an undergrad and you did physics experiments or chemistry experiments, they worked out in 80 or 90% of the cases simply because they were tested. Your teachers or teaching assistants spend a lot of time in testing those experiments and therefore they really worked. They knew exactly what the results are going to be and this is not the case in graduate school or in academia, right? So you are doing new science and really what you're used to, that assumption does not hold anymore. So now your failure rate is 80%. You're going into uncharted territory. You don't know what the results of those experiments are going to be, which is why you're making them in the first place, right? And that means the entire cycle from planning those experiments, doing those experiments, like starting your writing process and iterating through will actually take a lot longer simply because you didn't plan for how long these experiments are actually going to take. So the 80 to 90% of success rate that you're used to from high school or from undergrad now is actually your failure rate. And so you need to take that into account and you need to realize that a lot of experiments will fail and that's okay. You just have to plan for this. You have to account for this in your schedule or in your planning your experiments. And so these four assumptions are really something that you need to realize and you need to internalize. And once you know that, you can plan for things going wrong and which will make your process a lot faster. And also you don't plan for things like you're confused about the writing process. You don't know where to start. Which section are you gonna write first? How are you gonna write that section? You might have several ideas and they're just like in your head somewhere and you're trying to get this on the page, but then the story doesn't flow or how do you create a story in the first place? Or you have writer's block and you're like staring at the blank page and you're like, I have no no idea where to start or how to start or where to go from here. And so you start procrastinating or you might be in a stage where you actually have a draft and you are gathering feedback and it takes you endless and endless iterations with your co-authors to actually get somewhere and everybody keeps telling you something different. And there's way too many edits and iterations and the process actually ends up being way too laborious and time consuming. And then there's also what I call the curse of wishful thinking. You're like, okay, I'm so close. I want to submit this paper next month. And the next month you say the same thing. And you said that 10 months ago. And that's because you are conditioned to think that you, there is a defined outcome and a known outcome, which is not. Before we get into the top secrets that I'm using to make my rating a breeze, is if you like this type of content and want to get notified when new videos come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and also comment below what types of problems you're struggling with most when you are writing anything, when you're writing a paper, when you're writing a fellowship proposal, when you're writing anything. Let me know so I can create videos around those topics and can help you best. So the first question that we're going to talk about here is how to attract readers to your paper and actually make it easier to write. And that is really, you have to think about what is the goal of your paper. The goal of your paper is to convey information to the reader. And so let's think about for a second, if you have a conversation with someone, right? So you're talking to a friend or you're talking to, you know, somebody in your family and they're asking you, hey, what do you do in grad school or what type of research are you working on right now? So you can then talk to them about what you're doing but you see their reaction, how they react to something. Do they have questions? All right, guys, my light gave out for the second time. And so I think we're just going to continue without it. Okay, so let's go back to what is the goal of the paper? The goal of the paper is to convey information to the reader, right? And if you have a conversation with somebody, you can tell them exactly what you're doing and you will see their reaction, right? So you will see from their body language, whether they understand what you're saying, 
Do you have to explain things a little bit differently for them to understand what you're doing? This is really where they can ask questions and you can answer those questions to actually make sure they understand what you're trying to tell them. So now think about a paper. In a paper, you're conveying that information to the reader via a paper. The problem is you cannot see their face. You cannot see their body language. And therefore, you don't know, you know how they're going to react to your writing. And what you need to do when you're writing your paper is ideally you want to shift your focus from yourself to the reader. And what do I mean by this? When you're starting out a writing project, what most people do is they think about themselves. They think about how do I put this information in my head onto the page? But that's not actually the question you should be asking yourself. The question you should be asking yourself is what does my reader over there need to be able to understand what I'm trying to tell them? And so if you picture them, if you picture who your audience is, and it makes it actually a lot easier for you to write because you're taking into account their needs and you're taking into account who they are, what their background is. Do they understand all the specific expert lingo that you're trying to use? Or do they need a little bit more of an introduction? And so taking this into account actually makes it a lot easier for you to write your paper. And also it makes it a lot easier for people in related areas to be able to read your paper and actually gain something from it. So really focus on the reader. Who is the reader? Think about the reader might be another graduate student who is, this is like their fifth paper that they have to read that day. They're most likely very busy. They're super busy. Maybe they have a thousand things in their head. Maybe they just had a big lunch and have low energy levels or because they're tired because they've been working 14 hours a day. So think about that when you write your paper, because taking this into account actually allows you to write for them and not for you. So you want to write for your reader instead of for yourself. Obviously, if you're publishing a paper, the goal is also for you to get a publication out of it. But if you are thinking about who your reader is, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to write your paper. And secondly, it's actually going to get more exposure simply because they're going to have an easier time finding your paper, interacting with it, and getting something out of it in the first place. So how can you make it easy for them? You need to be brief, you need to be clear, and you need to be quantitative. Because ultimately, and this is something that I always teach my students, the reader ultimately wants to read the paper without reading the paper. And what does that mean? There's a couple of different tips and tricks that I'm teaching in my Zero to Publish program that's linked down below, but basically use layout that facilitates skimming. And there's a lot more that goes into it, but essentially think about yourself when you are reading a paper. How do you read a paper? Do you want to read an abstract with so much expert language that you don't actually even really want to read it? Or does that put you off and you rather have something that flows really well with like great figures and a great storyline and things like that? So think about that when you're writing your paper. Now, defining the reader or your audience where your paper will also set the tone of your paper. It will define how much detail you will write in specific sections and where you put those specific sections where you're going to write certain things in the supplement or whether you are going to put that in the main paper. And it will also define how the story will be written. So you need to ask yourself, who is your audience? Is this, does your audience consist mainly of biologists, chemists, computer scientists, mathematicians? Because each profession understands things very differently and you need to keep that in mind to get the greatest exposure of your paper after it's published. So now let's answer the question of how to get more citations for your research paper. And so some of these things I've already mentioned in terms of how to get more exposure by focusing on the reader, but also make it pretty. And make it pretty sounds like a very superficial thing to think about, but it really boils down to how to make publication quality figures and how to make them really well. And so there's a couple of things that I want to share with you here. The first one is to decide on a color scheme early on and stick with it for all of your figures. And this is something that took me years to figure out to actually do this in the first place. But if you come up with a color scheme that works for you and then actually stick to it for all of your figures. It gives your entire paper a very consistent look. It tells your story in a very consistent way because let's say a specific type of data is always represented by a specific type of color and it just looks a lot more polished and professional, which is exactly what you want, right? And that polished and professional look makes it easier for you to convince your editor to send the paper out for review, will makes it easier for you to convince your readers to actually want to stick with your paper and actually want to read it. So try to avoid the red green color combination for colorblind people, choose grayscale figures if you can, because you will have to pay or your PI will have to pay color charges for color figures 
and avoid stark contrasts unless it helps the figure. And also a couple other things, choose primary colors that are not too bright, but that are distinguishable. If you need many colors, then I usually choose a lighter and a darker version of the same colors. And also use color palettes that convert very well into grayscale. And so again, this goes back to using grayscale figures if you can. So now how to make publication quality figures in terms of content, right? The first point is really this almost goes without saying, you should quantify your data such that your conclusions of the paper are supported by the data. And this sounds like such an obvious thing to do, but there are papers that I've reviewed where the conclusions of the paper were not supported by the data. And obviously this is a really easy way for your paper to get rejected, right? So then the second thing is, and this is one mistake that a lot of people are making is you need to only show what needs to be shown in order to convey the story and everything else should go into the supplement. Because what happens oftentimes is that you have a research project, you try a whole bunch of different things, and it's not a consistent storyline yet, but you end up actually putting everything into the paper. And so it becomes a random mumbo jumbo of data and figures and information without a real storyline, without really telling the reader what is going on. And that actually makes it incredibly difficult for anybody to read your paper. So next, I always use one statement, one main conclusion per figure or table that I'm representing. And that really makes it a lot easier for the reader to get away with a few different things that you want to tell them without getting buried in lots and lots of information and data. And then lastly, for publication quality figures, figure out a best possible way for you to convey that conclusion in the data that you're showing them. So you want to make sure that they can look at the figure and that it can take a few seconds to grasp that information without having to spend 10 minutes trying to understand what your figure is trying to tell them. And that is also really a major point to make it easier for your reader to understand. And now the next thing is the visuals, right? So for your publication quality figure, think about to remove unnecessary details. You need to ask yourself, is the font size legible? Limit the number of font sizes that you have in your figure because like you can't really read tiny fonts. Ask yourself, are all axes labeled? Avoid shadows as much as possible. Try to not make it fancy. Really keep things simple. The simpler, the better. And then also lastly, when you have a figure that is made up of sub panels, when you resize those sub panels, make sure that all of the font is still legible after you put everything into the figure. And so usually what I do is when I'm done with a figure and I have an idea of how big that is going to be in the journal, print it out on a piece of paper and actually look at it. If you can't read it, then it's a pretty good indication that your font sizes are too small. Next, show useful data. So in this example over here on the left-hand side, we can't really see what's going on in there at all. It just looks like a hairball of... I don't, I think it's probably a protein interaction network. Whereas on the right hand side, this is simplified and only the most important pieces of data are shown. And you can actually look at it. You can actually gain some information from that graph, right? And so this is really what the goal is here. Make sure that what you're showing is actually useful to the reader. Avoid 3D plots as much as possible. And I know 3D plots are sometimes like, they can be very pretty, but putting a 3D plot into two dimensions really removes one dimension of information, which makes it a lot more difficult to understand where on the axes your data point actually falls onto. So avoid 3D plots as much as possible or find ways to display your information in a different way. Avoid visual clutter. And again, I'm showing examples over here where you have either too many colors, too many different colors, you have serif and sans serif fonts, you have too many different font sizes, your fonts are like so close to each other that they almost overlap, things like that. You have too many abbreviations, you have no idea what's going on in this figure, so these are definitely things to avoid. Then let's talk about figure captions for a second. Figure captions should stand on their own. So anybody should be able to understand what you're trying to tell them. They should be able to look at one figure and one caption and understand part of the entire story in the paper that you're trying to tell them. So your figure caption should not be like, oh, all of this is described in this particular section. The goal of a figure caption is to describe what's shown in the figure and not more or less. Don't use abbreviations, keep it brief. There's usually a word limit that the journal dictates. If you need more than the word limit, it really means your figure is not clear enough and you need to go back and redo the visuals for your figure. So now let's talk about how to make your research paper more interesting. And this is really to tell a story. 
And you're probably thinking, but I'm a scientist. What about storytelling? Remember when maybe when you were a kid and you went camping and your family would sit around the campfire and would tell each other stories. Storytelling is one of the oldest ways to keep information alive, whether this would be around a campfire or TED Talks. TED Talks are just so much fun to listen to because they're really, they're done incredibly well. And what most of them do is they tell a story. And people remember stories and not just data points. So wrap your data points into a story and it can be a scientific story and it should be a scientific story most of the time, but don't just keep things so dry, right? So science is inherently interesting. Think about high school. You did all of those cool, fun experiments, or even now you're doing all those cool and fun experiments. Present it that way. Make it interesting. Write your paper in a way that the reader doesn't fall asleep reading it. So really consider this when you write your paper. And again, I'm going to teach you more about how to create a great storyline and how to put the elements of your paper into that storyline to really make your paper easier to write and easier to read. And so if you want to learn more about how to write and publish a scientific manuscript, you can check out the description below. I have this guide for how to make publication quality figures, and I also have other resources available. I've taught many grad students and undergrads and postdocs how to write and publish their papers. And if you want me to do the same for you, you can join us in the Zero to Publish program. The link is below in the description. And uh, let's get your paper out. If you would like to dive a little deeper in how to write good papers, you can check out my six-part series over here. So this is the first video in the series where I go into a lot more detail of my process. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.